get the camera adjusted a little bit. Loud. Sounds good. Oh, yes. I'll share the screen first. Okay, it's working. All right. Joan Moisek is a paleontology PhD candidate and Vanier scholar at the University of Toronto Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and Royal Ontario Museum, supervised by Dr. Jean Bernard Caron. Following many years of interest in Ontario's rich fossil record, Joe first joined the ROM Invertebrate Paleontology section in 2012 as a high school intern and subsequently earned his BSc at the U of T, the departments of EEB and Earth Sciences. His research currently focuses on exceptionally preserved arthropod fossils with field work taking him to a variety of sites across Ontario and British Columbia. And I believe the ROM is going to have an exhibit about this particular uh, fossil. Fact, yep, the exhibit's already there. You can already go and see it. So I'll show you some pictures at the end yeah. of the talk. Okay, thanks. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for that intro introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here talking to you tonight. Uh, I think this is probably going to be a little bit of a divergence from your usual content at these meetings and covering some subjects that are a little bit older than you're used to dealing with, but hopefully that'll be uh, an interesting little diversion. So today I have the pleasure of talking about some new and exciting fossil discoveries that have been made in Ontario, not so far from here. And this was work that was done uh, in my lab, along with my supervisor, Jean Bernard, as well as uh, a lab mate of mine, Alejandro, uh, and an a amateur fossil collector from Ontario, uh, George Campouris. So this is actually a little bit of a divergence from the sort of work that I typically do as well. So I actually do most of my PhD work on fossils from British Columbia, from a very famous deposit called the Burgess Shale. A couple of pictures that I'm showing here from some field work that we just got back from uh, at the end of August this year. And this is a really special site because it gives us a unique window into a very important period of time in Earth's history that I'll explain a little bit later. Um, but these fossils are remarkably well preserved at this site and are world famous. And so the link between these fossils in British Columbia and the stuff that I'm gonna be talking about from Ontario today is that they represent cases of exceptional fossil preservation. And so we call these sites, this German term, Konservatlagerstatten. And so this basically means something along the lines of mother load. And so these sites are special because we get things that we would never ordinarily expect to get in the fossil record. So I'm talking about things like uh, eyes and nervous systems, and the guts of the animals that still contain their last meals, showing us this unparalleled insight into what these organisms were like in the deep, deep past. Uh, you need special and relatively uncommon conditions to get this sort of preservation, as opposed to things that we more typically think of in the fossil record, like bones and shells, which are relatively uh, difficult to decay, and they tend to stick around long enough that you can get preservation a little bit more easily. Share. Oops. So can we try that again? Just for the folks on Zoom. Yes. No worries. We only got to one slide anyway. Uh, how about now? Did I not share? Maybe I didn't share. That's why. Ah, yes. Okay. My bad. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> sure, no problem. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about some exceptional fossils from southern Ontario. Uh, here's a couple of photos that I mentioned of our field work in British Columbia from this summer. I'm also happy to talk a little bit about that if you guys have questions about that later. 
But anyway, I was just talking a little bit about these Konservat Lagerstätten, so these sites of exceptional preservation. And these sites are places where we get things like complete fish skeletons that are fully articulated, uh, but we also can get things like I mentioned, like uh, nervous systems, eyes, soft tissues that we would expect to be very difficult to preserve. And uh, sometimes, as in the central image here, even cases where we get cellular level preservation in these fossils. So these things really give us incredible insight into past life. And so going back to the Burgess Shale site that I work on a lot, here's just a really nice graphic uh, showing the importance of this kind of soft tissue preservation for our view of the past. So the upper image here represents a case of the Burgess Shale where we have preservation of soft tissues as, as we actually have at that site. And then the lower image here represents a case where we don't have preservation of soft tissues. And so you can see how much more we see when we actually get this soft tissue preservation. And so this is why scientists like me are so interested in these particular sites. So the Burgess Shale comes from a time period in Earth's history called the Cambrian period. And so it's just a little over 500 million years ago. And this period is very important for us in terms of understanding the evolution of animal life, because it's during this time that we see the first representatives of essentially all of the major modern groups of animals appearing in the fossil record almost at the same time. And all of these major animal body plans have actually remained remarkably stable over the subsequent 500 million years. So we think there's a really interesting evolutionary phenomenon that's going on in the Cambrian period, which is one of the things that my lab is very interested in understanding. So, yes. It's just that the screen isn't coming through on uh, PowerPoint. So if you're able to just kind of exit the full screen with your Someone PowerPoint. Says it's screen with you, not share with you. Uh, okay. Uh, it's probably, uh, I think I had this problem before, so I'm just going to take it off okay. speaker view. Um, I mean, Let's just go like this. Hopefully this should work now. No worries. Let's get it right. All right. Yes, so um, I was gonna say not only do we have representatives of basically all of the major modern groups of animals in the Cambrian fossil record about 500 million years ago, but we also have some really bizarre looking animals which have made the Burgess Shale quite famous. Um, these so-called weird wonders, which uh, were popularized in a popular science book by the famous biologist Stephen Jay Gould back in the uh, late 80s. Uh, and this is an image here of a, a new weird wonder that we actually described just this summer called Stanley Karras. This thing has three eyes on its head uh, and it has a pair of jointed claws at the front of its head showing us that it's a relative of insects and spiders, but it has a body with these flexible swimming flaps along the side, which is like nothing that we have around today. So not only do we have uh, representatives of major modern groups, but we also have these very interesting uh, extinct groups that have no modern analogs. Now today I'm gonna be focusing on a different group of these weird uh, animals, which has no close modern relatives. And so these things are called the morellomorphs. So the most famous morellomorph is called Morella splendens. And it is known from the Burgess Shale. I'm showing an image of it here. And so it was actually one of the first fossils that was discovered at the Burgess Shale about 100 years ago by Charles Doolittle Walcott, who was a paleontologist from the Smithsonian in the United States. And you can see on the right here that he uh, sketched Morella in his notebook all that time ago. Um, Morella, as I mentioned, has no close modern relatives, and we still have a lot of questions about where exactly it fits in the evolutionary tree of life. But the big question that I want to focus on in today's talk is what was going on after the Cambrian period? So I mentioned that we have sites like the Burgess Shale preserving fossils from the Cambrian, uh, but as it turns out, this window for soft tissue preservation that we see in deep ocean settings in the Cambrian period, which led to the preservation of sites like the Burgess Shale and others around the world, sort of closes off 
after the Cambrian period. And so we have much fewer uh, examples of soft tissue preservation in these open marine settings after the Cambrian. And because of that, we kind of lose this window into what life was like, what the soft bodied organisms were like uh, in the time period following the Cambrian. So if we look at the fossil record at large and at the sort of shelled organisms that we typically see as fossils, we see that there's this broad pattern over the last 500 million years where we see this sort of waxing and waning of these major so-called evolutionary faunas, which are basically groups of organisms that have uh, diversified and then gone extinct at similar times. And so we can sort of statistically parse out these different evolutionary faunas which characterize these major periods of Earth history. But again, this is all based on uh, shelly fossil organisms that have hard parts that are readily preservable. But as we saw earlier in the talk, looking only at the shelled organisms gives you a huge bias in terms of what life was actually like during these times, because there's so many of these organisms that we just aren't seeing at these uh, particular fossil sites. And so uh, for this talk, I'm going to be focusing on some new discoveries that help to fill in that missing window in time in terms of understanding soft-bodied organisms after the Cambrian period. And in particular, we're going to be looking at this period that immediately follows the Cambrian, which is called the Ordovician period. So we're talking about a time here around 450 million years ago, or for context, that's about six and a half times the age of Tyrannosaurus rex. So these are some extremely ancient fossils, some of the, the oldest large bodied fossils that we have. Uh, and of course, I'll be focusing on North America. So I just wanted to highlight that the world was a little bit different in the Ordovician period. Uh, so North America was actually sort of shifted on its side at this time due to the effects of continental drift over long periods of time. Uh, and it was located near the equator so we're talking about a relatively tropical environment uh, and sea levels were also a little bit higher at this time and had flooded onto large parts of the continent. So the area that we are standing on right now would have in fact been under a shallow ocean. And you can imagine that this ocean would have been teeming with all kinds of life. So here's a little graphical representation of what the environment looked like in the Ordovician period. So we had these um, sort of uh, surface exposures of the Canadian Shield, which formed a bit of an island uh, that was largely to the north of us. And then we had these expansive reefs extending way, way out from the continent. Uh, this is sort of like an analog to the modern day Bahama Banks. So you can imagine this tropical extensive reef that is uh, teeming with life. And so again, just taking a little zoom out here to understand what things actually look like in the Ordovician. Uh, this is the geology of Southern Ontario and Michigan. And you can see that there's a structure here called the Michigan Basin, which is very important for us in terms of understanding uh, the environment that was existing here 450 million years ago. So the Michigan Basin is basically like a bowl that formed in the middle of the continent and filled in with this shallow ocean. Uh, and gradually sediments filled up this bowl over time, layer by layer, uh, and gave rise to, for example, large reef-like structures which formed the Niagara Escarpment, which Guelph is situated on, uh, and other important structures that, that characterize the topography of Southern Ontario. So where we are is essentially right at the edge of this bowl. And here's a little zoom in again to show you uh, more closely the geology of Southern Ontario. And so the, the key feature here is that as we move from the blue, blue stuff on the right into the green stuff on the left, we're getting into younger and younger sediments because we're going into the center of the bowl and we're kind of moving upwards because the sides of the bowl are sloping downwards into Michigan. And so in this talk, I'm gonna be focusing in particular on the stuff that's highlighted here in blue, which is representing the Ordovician sediments in Ontario. And so you can see outcrops 
of this Ordovician sediment in a lot of places in southern Ontario. Some of them are quite famous, like Craigleaf Provincial Park on uh, Georgian Bay, which has this incredible richness of fossils. Uh, you can also see some really nice stuff at Presqu'ile Provincial Park. Uh, and even for me growing up in Toronto, you can see amazing outcrops of Ordovician rocks in the ravines that cut through the city. And just to give you an idea of some of the organisms that were living there, we have things like bivalves, clams and mussels and their relatives. We have these interesting uh, cone-shaped shells that seem to be segmented. And these are actually cephalopod shells. So they're relatives of squid and octopus that had a hard shell that's readily preserved. We see snails and uh, these shellfish called brachiopods, which superficially look a bit like clams, corals, and other things that you might expect to find in these warm oceans. Uh, some other famous representatives are the trilobites. So these guys look a little bit like a pill bug, although they're not super closely related. They're a totally extinct group. And they are uh, incredibly diverse in terms of their form with I believe about 60,000 species known from across their uh, geologic history. And there's a huge diversity of them that you can find in Southern Ontario. And then we also find these beautiful groups of echinoderms. So that is relatives of things like starfish and sea urchins. Uh, but back in the Ordovician period, we actually had an even greater diversity of these animals than we have today with all kinds of weird forms like the ones that I'm showing here, which uh, demonstrated everything from uh, um, bilateral symmetry to five-way symmetry like most modern echinoderms to a complete lack of symmetry. So a huge diversity of forms of these animals exceptionally preserved in Ontario. And so as you might imagine then, Ontario is probably one of the best places in the world that you can go to study what life was like in the Ordovician period. But as I mentioned, these are all of these things that I've showed you so far are the shelly organisms. So what about all of these soft bodied organisms that we don't typically get preserved? So thinking more broadly again, and about the whole world, there are a few sites in the Ordovician period that show us a little bit about what soft-bodied organisms looked like during this time. Uh, there's a very famous one in Morocco in particular. And uh, interestingly, the, the soft-bodied organisms that we find in the Ordovician period remind us a little bit of stuff that we find in the Cambrian before it, and a little bit of stuff that we find in some of the subsequent periods. So we seem to be in this key transitional phase and yet, as you can see, there's still relatively few of these sites around the world. And so far, not much really in North America. There are a few sites that do preserve soft tissues in North America, but for the most part, these represent environments that are very unusual. So, for example, these hypersaline lagoons that you might find at the edge of the continent, or extremely deep environments. And so in all of these cases, we can question whether these environments are giving us a good representation of what the life was like in these diverse um, uh, communities of, of shelled organisms that we find in the more typical fossil deposits. And so this comes to the point of my talk today. Uh, so we were fortunate enough to get connected with a amateur fossil collector in Ontario named George Campouris. And George has been collecting for many years in Ontario and uh, looking mainly for these shelly organisms that are so diverse here and beautifully well preserved. And uh, George secured the uh, ability to go fossil collecting in a particular quarry that's located a little bit east of Lake Simcoe. Uh, so they actually uh, sort of set aside a little platform in the corner of the quarry for him to do some digging and allowed him to systematically excavate the bedding planes at the top of this quarry. So this was a, a very um, unique and extensive uh, work that George was doing here uh, to give us a, a great idea of how the communities of organisms varied bed by bed. And I'm showing an image of the quarry on the upper right here where when I visited there and they did some uh, blasting. So it's quite an active place and they were very kind to allow uh, the, the uh, science to go on there. So this particular quarry has already 
hit the headlines a little bit because it preserves this incredible record of shelled organisms. So we have these things called crinoids or sea lilies, which look a little bit like a flower, but they're actually more like a starfish on a stalk. These things are echinoderms, they're animals related to modern sea stars and uh, sea urchins. Uh, and we have this incredible diversity of these crinoids found at this particular quarry in Brecon, Ontario. And these crinoids are exceptionally well preserved because their bodies are made up of a bunch of little pieces which tend to break apart very readily after the organism dies. And so to get these crinoids in their fully articulated form like this, we knew that you needed special conditions. And so some very nice work was done by some colleagues of ours, reconstructing the sort of environmental conditions that led to the preservation of these crinoids. And so as it turns out, you have the formation of this surface on the seafloor called a hard ground, which is essentially um, forming from the, the uh, seafloor turning to stone, um, being cemented by minerals shortly after it forms on the seafloor. And then uh, you have some currents that come through, sort of exhume the bottom surface and erode out these large cavities, creating this very rough surface. Uh, and this very rough surface at Brecon, as it turns out, was an ideal environment for all kinds of marine organisms in the Ordovician. So they loved growing around these large mounds that formed on the seafloor. And then over time, we had storm deposits that brought sediment from farther away and rapidly buried these encrusting organisms on the seafloor, preserving them in their positions of life. And so we think it's this rapid burial that was really key for the exceptional preservation of the things like crinoids and others. Uh, and this rapid burial happened repeatedly. So we have these multiple snapshots at the Brecon Quarry of uh, what life was like on the seafloor at that time. So I'm just showing an actual image of the rocks at the quarry here. And you can see one of these mounds, which is labeled M41 here, which is projecting up through some of the layers that have been deposited around and on top of it. And so it's around these mounds that we actually find the greatest diversity of marine organisms that were living there. However, while George was collecting some of these beautiful crinoids and trilobites and other shelled organisms, he also happened to notice that there were some unusual fossils mixed into the bunch. So he found some things that looked like branching algae, which are not usually mineralized. And so these things are unusual in the fossil record. He found some uh, fragments that looked like the carapaces of arthropods or relatives of uh, insects and crabs uh, and a few other bits and pieces. The fossils are relatively rare compared to the shelled organisms. But when you add everything up together, you actually find that they make up a considerable portion of the diversity of organisms at the Brecon site. And the most exciting discovery that George made, which we were immediately stunned by, is this thing, which is a specimen of an animal called a morellomorph. And so again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we know of these animals from other sites, including the Burgess Shale in BC, uh, from these exceptional fossil sites. And as soon as we saw this specimen, we immediately recognized it as belonging to this particular group of animals. This is a really spectacular piece and completely unexpected in this location because we had no idea that soft tissue preservation was possible here. So we actually, the, the specimen is found in a piece of shale. And so when, in the, when it was uh, discovered, it was split in half with different parts ending up on each side. And luckily my supervisor Jean Bernard is an ace at uh, preparing these specimens and was able to remove some of the rock that was overlying the different pieces. And so you can see the different parts on the part and the counterpart, the two halves of this specimen. And then thanks to Photoshop, I was able to digitally put back together the parts on the two halves of this fossil to get an idea of what the whole creature looked like. And so here it is with my color drawing on the right here. So I'll just go through a few features. So the structure in orange here is actually the head shield. So this thing 
has this sort of hexagonal central uh, head shield. And then we have these four very elongated spines that are curved like these long horns coming off from either side. Uh, and these things each have a series of small secondary spines that look like a bunch of fingers extending out from the edges. The other really remarkable feature about this animal is that it has this absolutely massive pair of legs, which I've colored in blue here. And each one of these legs has this really interesting tip where the uh, segment that's second from the tip has this long spine, and then the tip segment is sort of bent outwards a little bit like a foot. And so this was very interesting to us. And then we found a few other uh, sets of appendages. So this one that I've highlighted in purple here, which belongs to the head. And then there's a series of appendages that I've highlighted in pink, which belong to the body of the animal. Uh, and we know from relatives of this animal from other sites that we're probably missing the very far back end of the body of this particular specimen. And so there probably would have been more sets of legs behind these pink ones. But other than that, this specimen is remarkably complete. And it gives us a lot of the really important characteristics that we need to understand this animal. And then finally, uh, the preservation of this specimen is actually really nice. When you zoom in on the legs, you can see these tiny pores, which we think would have actually housed small sensory hairs that the animal might have been using to work its way around on the seafloor. And we did a little bit of elemental mapping at the University of Windsor. Uh, to figure out what the chemical composition of this fossil was. And the main finding was that uh, the fossil is primarily composed of carbon. And this is actually a feature that it shares in common with fossils from the Burgess Shale in British Columbia. So we think that something similar was going on in terms of preservation of this fossil uh, with its counterparts in the older sites in BC. And so finally, we were able to put together a reconstruction of the parts of this animal that we had. This was a nice drawing done by my lab mate, Alejandro Izquierdo Lopez. And we were able to commission a local student artist to do a really nice rendering of this animal in its environment in Brecon. And so you can imagine that this animal would have been crawling across the seafloor using these long stilt-like legs to sort of stilt its way along uh, and probably feeding on small particles and small organisms either in the mud or in the water column. And it would have shared its environment with this incredibly diverse fauna of uh, things like crinoids, trilobites, and a few of these uh, algae and other organisms that I mentioned. And uh, yeah, so I just wanted to mention this, this uh, particular morella morph although it's known from a single specimen, is so exceptionally well-preserved that we're quite sure that it represents a new genus and species of this animal. And so we actually named it Tomlin Sonus Demetrii. Uh, the first name comes from the quarry that it was discovered in. And so we wanted to try and understand the context of Tomlin Sonus. Where did it come from? What was it related to? Um, we immediately recognized it as a member of this very peculiar group of arthropods called the morellomorphs, which includes all of the animals that I have pictured here, which have been found at sites spanning for tens of millions of years uh, across the globe. They have a very patchy fossil record with uh, relatively few sites actually preserving them. So every new specimen that we find of these organisms helps us to better understand the group as a whole. And so you can see that uh, some of these morellomorphs, in particular the ones on the left, are characterized by these really peculiar head shields that have this smaller central portion and then these long horn-like spines. And so again, we were immediately able to tell that our new species must belong to this subgroup of the morellomorphs, which we call the morellid morellomorphs. But we wanted to go a little bit further, so we did what I like to do a lot, which is uh, reconstruct evolutionary trees. And so this is the tree that we came up with mapped over the uh, time scale of the evolution of this morellomorph group. And so the kind of neat things that I wanna highlight about this 
although it's a, it's a very complicated looking uh, diagram, but the, the, the key takeaways are that this new species, Tomlinsonus, uh, fills in a bit of a gap in terms of the time scale of this group of animals. So it occupies a space where we didn't know that these animals uh, existed and fills in a gap between younger and older specimens. Uh, which so, so we would have assumed that there were representatives of this group during this time period, but this is the, the direct evidence that they were there. And then uh, we were also able to draw some potential conclusions about where these morellin morphs actually fit in terms of their relationships to modern organisms. And so we think uh, that they may actually be closely related to modern sea spiders, which are a unique group of uh, modern organisms, which despite their name are not closely related to spiders. Um, there's an image of one of these sea spiders here. Uh, so they also share these very long spindly stilt-like legs and they live in deep ocean environments today. And then back in the context of what we've learned about these organisms um, geographically, it turns out that Tomlinsonus is the northernmost occurrence of a morellomorph in the Ordovician period. It's the only case that we know of from Paleo North America during this time period. Uh, and as such, it's kind of filling in this gap in terms of our understanding of the geography of the morellomorphs during the Ordovician. And the other thing that, that is really neat about this discovery is that, as I mentioned, we did not expect to see a morellomorph popping up in Brecon Quarry because we didn't realize that this kind of preservation could happen in these open marine settings in the Ordovician period. It's the sorts of places that you tend to find all of these shelly organisms that are so characteristic of that time. And so we think that there's a great possibility that some of these things might have just been missed because they're very hard to see in the field. So we're hopeful that now that we know that this kind of soft tissue preservation is possible, that people will go back to some of these well-known sites and take another look and potentially we'll start to be able to fill in some missing parts of the picture of other soft bodied organisms that may have been living in these environments and previously unnoticed. So again, this, Discovery is important because it shows us that soft tissue preservation was possible on these open shelf environments in Paleo North America in the Ordovician period. Uh, the new species helps us fill in a gap in time and a gap in space in terms of our understanding of this particular group of animals. Uh, and then finally, uh, this discovery shows us that morellomorphs were probably pretty abundant in the Ordovician period because they're popping up now at various different sites around the world. So they may actually have been quite a common and key element of uh, Ordovician marine settings. And so as was mentioned at the beginning of the talk, this particular specimen of Tomlinsonus is now on display in the new Wilner Madge Dawn of Life Gallery, which just opened up at the Royal Ontario Museum in December. I really encourage all of you to come out and see it because I think it's a really fabulous gallery. We've been getting a ton of positive feedback on it because not only do we show the fossil material from uh, time periods which people are probably less familiar with, but also we have tons of multimedia and 3D models and artwork that I think really brings these organisms and their environments to life. And there's a huge feature of material from Ontario. So this is a, a very locally relevant gallery as well. And then finally, uh, because this discovery hit the news a little bit, we actually got some interest from a local artist who said he absolutely had to make a 3D model of this animal. So this was actually just completed last week and delivered to the ROM. And uh, sometime in the new year, it'll be going on display in the Dawn of Life Gallery as well. And so with that, I thank many of my colleagues for our good discussions and my supervisor, Jean Bernard, for bringing this project to me, uh, lots of funding sources, and um, of course our collaborator, George Campouris, who discovered the specimen and made it available for study. And uh, thank you all for listening.
Maybe I just need to stop yeah, those sharing. Those on or... Zoom can um, ask, put the questions in the chat, and we'll maybe get Emma to read them out, and then uh, I'll let you. So let you Sounds good. Things. Yeah, you mentioned Craig Reese, and I was just up there. And I was interested in the, the uh, history of that spot. Can you tell me why there was oil there in the shale? So a lot of um, hydrocarbons like oil come from organic material. And when you have sediments that are very rich in organisms, be those larger organisms, or uh, in that case, probably more like small plankton and stuff like this, then uh, you can get the formation of oil after you compress those sediments over long periods of time. So. No, in fact, actually, um, there's not much in the way of plants in the Ordovician period. So we're talking about a time when there was essentially no large life on land. There's a little bit of evidence of plant spores from this time, but there's actually no body fossils of plants from the Ordovician. They don't come around for another few tens of millions of years. Well, um, so it has been prepared. So when it was discovered, only part of it was sticking out of the rock, but luckily it was enough for all of us to recognize immediately what it was. Um, but also what we found really helps to image these specimens is to immerse them in water or alcohol and then use polarizing filters on the camera and on the light source. And that really helps to um, cut glare off these usually reflective specimens. And you can see a lot more details. I didn't really include a good image here of the, the difference between uh, using the polarizer and not using the polarizer, but sometimes it can be pretty extreme. You almost wouldn't see it without the polarizer. Yeah, so it's like maybe about 10 centimeters. So about uh, this size. It's a great question. Yeah. In this case, we let the artists have their license with the image. Most of the time with fossils, we don't know what color they were, but there are exceptions. And in fact, there's a specimen that I donated to the Dawn of Life Gallery, you can see it there, of uh, one of these shelled cephalopods, and it actually has remains of the color banding uh, still intact on the shell. There are other cases that people are getting really excited about where you have preserved evidence of fossil color. Uh, and so there's more and more of these popping up all the time. So it, it is sometimes possible to reconstruct color in fossils, but not in this particular case. Uh, for the imaging? So you have um, a polarizing filter on the lens of the camera or the microscope, and then you have one on the light source. I and mean, you turn them so that they're crossed with each other, and then you only allow like one uh, polarization of light through. Yeah, it's not really changing the color so much as um, like the, the orientation of the light. Sure. Yeah, as far as we know, these animals do not have eyes. Uh, this is the case for some of the other species in this group as well. Um, so it must have been feeling its way around with its antennae and maybe those sensory hairs on its legs. Um, in a shallow ocean, it would be large, but had eyes not been. There are definitely eyes at this time, but this particular group doesn't appear to have eyes. Yeah. And another question, is there a translation of the word large letter? Um, mother load, essentially. And essentially mother load. Okay. Um, 
Oh, and you asked about a mouth as well, right? Yeah, yeah so it does have a mouth. So there's a, a plate that covers the underside of the head, which you can probably see in the, oops, not this one. You can see um, there's a, a long structure that sort of is on the underside of the head of the animal here. Um, this is a plate that covers the mouth. And so underneath that mouth, or that, that plate is the, where the mouth is situated. Uh, yeah, in the back. I'm confused about the time period. Is the order of Michigan the same as the or are they different terrain? Uh, Ordovician comes before Silurian. So the stuff that we're standing on here in Guelph is Silurian. So we're a little bit younger than the rocks that I was talking about for the majority of this talk. Uh, not so much a drainage basin, but like a huge bowl or depression on the continent. And so as we move uh, basically southwestwards, we're getting into younger and younger sediments because we're moving into the center of the bowl. And you can imagine those sediments form layers along the sides of the bowl. Who's scientists know what caused the Permian to extinction? So the Permian extinction is a major extinction event that uh, happened quite a bit after the stuff that I was talking about here. But like I was talking about earlier in the talk, um, organisms, the, these groups of organisms, we can group into these things called evolutionary faunas, which are sort of bracketed by mass extinctions and radiations. And so the Permian extinction is the largest extinction event that we know of in Earth's history. It wiped out something like 95% of all life on Earth. Um, there are various ideas about what caused it, but I think the predominant one is related to volcanic eruptions. So you get lots of, uh, of um, greenhouse gases and, and other uh, gases that impact climate and acidify oceans and stuff like this. Uh, let's go over here. Yes, fascinating talk, thank you. In terms of the fossil there, can you, can you extract the whole fossil by pouring acid to remove the stone, or is there a way to get out of it? You said your advisor is very sort of deaf at uh, pulling out fossils, but can you actually pull out the whole fossil? Sometimes it's possible. In this case, if we were going to pour acid on this thing, I think we would end up with a bunch of little pieces, which would be impossible to put together. So that would not be recommended here. But uh, these particular fossils, like I mentioned, they're composed mainly of carbon. So they're basically a carbonaceous compression. And there are some people who are extracting some of these carbonaceous fossils by pouring hydrofluoric acid on them. Uh, usually they extract these tiny micro fossils from the rock because those are um, easier to, to get out in one piece. Um, so sometimes it's possible. I don't particularly want to work with hydrofluoric acid if I can help it either, but. <laughs> These things can be, um, you know, fractions of a millimeter. You need a microscope to see them. Is there any relationship There can be, yes. Yeah, and. Yep, like I mentioned, uh, you can sometimes get even cellular level of preservation. So the sorts of things that can be extracted from these sites include tiny parasites. There are already um, parasitic organisms related to modern parasitic groups that are known from the Cambrian period 500 million years ago. Would you call the modern sea spiders from fossils? Right, like a living fossil. Living fossil. Yeah, people, so, uh, people often use the term living fossil, although paleontologists usually tisk tisk at it because it's a little bit of an oxymoron. Um, but uh, 
it is true that we have examples of alongside uh, Morellon morphs, we actually have bona fide uh, sea spiders from at least the Silurian period. And we have larvae of sea spiders that look very similar to modern sea spider larvae from the Cambrian period. So we know that this is a very ancient group. No, no. So these these are all um, long dead and fossilized. So their their compositions have been changed over time. Uh, in the case of these fossils that I was talking about today, you could imagine that you've cooked these things with, to uh, burn off essentially everything but the carbon. So these are these are uh, these are long, long, long dead. This is not Jurassic Park. In the front. Did uh, the Morello Morse uh, survive into the Silurian? They did. And so far, the last one that we know of is in the, the Devonian. Uh, this is actually of the, of the particular subgroup that this one belongs to. This is the second youngest example, and the youngest one comes from the Devonian. And on that particular Uh, where was the head? So the whole orange thing here is the head shield. And then the pink parts are sort of the, the body, the legs from the body sticking backwards. So if I go back to uh, our reconstruction, we're looking at, at it head on here from sort of a front underside view. And then the body is going into the background. The little legs. I, I read a paper about uh, the Morello Morris in Czechoslovakia. Yeah. And um, mostly what the fossils depicted in the paper were just the uh, head. Uh, mm -hmm. head like a head shield, yeah. Head shield, yeah. And uh, no details, I've seen no details. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and this, you know, is amazing because it does show that it was underneath the head shield. Uh, were there examples in the Burgess Shale that, that also did that? Like, did you sort of have a pretty good idea of uh, the underside and the look like? Yeah. You know, you found this particular fossil? Yeah. So um, there's sort of different levels of soft tissue preservation. There are, you know, things that are um, not mineralized, but still pretty robust. And they can survive pretty well. Like um, you could imagine, like the shell of a crab is pretty robust, even though it might not be mineralized. Um, and then there are things like nervous systems and you know things like jellyfish that are super super soft. Um, and so sometimes you can get conditions that can preserve more robust soft tissues, but not um, not the super labile and, and soft ones. Um, so, uh, um, the, the Czech examples that you were talking about, for example, the head shield is a bit more robust than some of the other parts of the body. So you get that preserving in that case, but at other sites like the Burgess shale, we get the whole body with not only the legs from the trunk part of the body, but also like internal organs and all kinds of stuff even uh, examples of them freshly molting. So we know these things molted like a modern insect and shed their exoskeleton. And, and I think the, uh, was the antenna, or the as the antenna here, uh, could you actually see it in the fossil? The antenna were not in this particular fossil. So we, we inferred that they're probably there based on the relatives, but we don't know for sure. What can you say about the boreal and the relationships that have with um, preserving those lands for research and excavation. I mean, is it a quid pro quo sort of like they're doing this really for science or for their reputation? And what's the risk? Of, like we're surrounded by quarries right here, and um, and uh, I mean, are we losing valuable potential research sites since we're such a center or? Or are you able to isolate it more to just certain sorts of quarries and, 
and then those owners banding together to offer it up. What, what do you say about that? Yeah, I mean, all quarries are, you know, destroying rock, and so some fossils will be destroyed. But we wouldn't be finding them at all if the quarries weren't there, because they're the only ones that are actually digging deeply these rocks. So this discovery would never have been made without the help of these quarry owners. And we're just lucky that in this case, they were um, so amenable to having George go in there and, and do some work. Uh, of course, it's you know, a bit of a, it can be a safety hazard for these quarries to allow random people that aren't employees in there. So it's very generous of them to do that. And uh, it's important to, to um, uh, you know, promote those kind of relationships because this is very important for science. Uh, Are you? the best preserved fossils usually found in shales? or also uh, good fossil records to other types of rocks. Perhaps there are very few shale deposits, extensive ones in Ontario, which may explain the toxicity of fossil records. Yeah, these are in shales, but uh, exceptionally preserved fossils can be found in all different kinds of sedimentary rocks. Uh, usually you get different types of preservation. So this particular type of carbonaceous compression is something that you typically see in shales. So that much is true. There's definitely an impact of the environment and you know the resulting rock type that gets formed in that environment on the potential for preservation of soft tissues. Um, Dr. Did, uh, were, were you actually there when you found or when this uh, specimen was, was found? I wasn't there when this particular one was found, uh, but I did visit the site afterwards and do a little bit of digging there. The split of the rock. Uh, that was uh, George Campouris who donated the specimen. How long ago was it found? Uh, I think that was uh, two summers ago. He's actually been working at the site for, I believe, about five years. And this was sort of towards the end of his work there. So he'd actually, the, the, the quarry essentially set aside a platform for him to work where they weren't blasting. He's excavated all of the layers on that platform. And now the platform is basically played out. So that's it for this particular site for now, unless the quarry decides to do a bit more digging somewhere else. And is this a particular uh, uh, fossil uh, only known from so far one specimen? So far one specimen, so far only one site. But there's good potential that more will be found somewhere else now that we know the exact uh, layer that they're coming out from. You've got a little shale. How do you know whether to bother split it or not? In fact, I've been to um, languages in mm -hmm. England and split the rocks and found uh, a couple of nets. Um, but it's touch and go whether it will split in the right place. And how do you know there's something in there? Okay. It's a bit of skill and a bit of luck. Yeah. So first you wanna uh, identify rocks that might be promising. So you wanna look for the right layers where, for example, in this case, uh, layers that represent rapid burial horizons. So if you don't have rapid burial, you don't have much hope of finding soft bodied fossils. Once you identify the beds that have been deposited through rapid burial by looking at the sedimentary structures, for example, then you know that you're in a place that might be worth looking. And then it's just a matter of luck. You have to split as much rock as you can and see what you can find. And then does, does the rock split where the fossil is? Often they do because the fossils will form a bit of a weak plane in the rock itself. So when you split, it'll tend to pass through the fossil, which is exactly what happened in this case. If you're dealing with really small things though, it doesn't always work out that nicely, which is when some of these approaches like dissolving the bulk samples of rock and acid can be helpful. So how did you get interested in paleontology? Is that through biology or did somebody give you a dinosaur model when you were a kid or how did that, how does that work? I've always been a bit of a naturalist. I was like the bug kid picking up logs and rocks in the backyard and uh, then I got into fossils by 
exploring some of the ravines around Toronto and finding some of the Ordovician age fossils there. And it, at the time they had a series at the ROM called the uh, Fossil Gem and Mineral Identification Clinics. So you can actually bring stuff that you found in there and meet with the curators and they will help you identify what kind of stuff you found. And so over the years, I would bring stuff into the identification clinics periodically and got to know some of the curators there. And then ultimately ended up working as a volunteer in the lab and have stuck around as long as I can. <laughs> Great questions, guys. Thanks a lot. That's right. Yeah. When we were talking to the artist, he was like, how big do you want me to make it? I can make it human sized if you want. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. One more? Sure. Uh, have you been to uh, Rock Glen and, uh, and uh, have you looked at the fossils that are found there? Uh, there are a couple of mineralizing springs, I understand. Uh, anything uh, particularly interesting? Yeah, it was at Rock Glen. Um, I don't remember the, oh, remind me where Rockland is. I know the name, but I'm forgetting. Arcona. Arcona, yes, yes, I thought so. Yes, no, I, I have definitely been to Arcona. I go there periodically, actually, and uh, spend more time at the, the private quarries there, um, which are a little bit better for finding fossils than the Rockland Park itself. But um, yeah, th that site is incredibly rich. It's probably one of the richest fossil beds in Ontario. It's a little bit younger than this stuff, so it's actually from the Devonian period. And um, uh, there is actually a little bit of soft tissue preservation that has been found there as well. There was one uh, bristle worm that was found there that's totally replicated in pyrite or fool's gold. But so far, that's the only example of a soft bodied organism that's been found there. It's a bit of a weird one off. So and, and crinoids don't constitute uh, soft tissue preservation parts? Uh, well, so the crinoid body is made up of um, a bunch of, like the skeleton is made up of a bunch of little plates. So to get a complete crinoid, you need exceptional conditions because you need to have those plates stay together and not be broken up by scavengers or water currents or whatever. But just because you find the skeleton doesn't mean that you actually have the actual soft tissue preserving. It just means that uh, the thing was relatively undisturbed. So that, again, it's sort of levels of exceptional preservation where sometimes you get articulated skeletons, sometimes you get articulated skeletons with some non-mineralized parts, and then sometimes you get the whole deal. Joseph, I just like to indicate you're on behalf you know, you initially suggested at the beginning of your presentation that it was somewhat divergent compared to what maybe we normally um, discuss, but you can see from the questions here, there's nothing divergent about bringing us such a wonderful presentation and stimulating our imaginations. And who knew that Ontario had so many uh, wonderful um, fossil records and sites and impressed me all correctly or or correctly. I'm not actually been that far away from my college, not that far away. I didn't even know it was just so very close. Sharing with us the uh, the ancient histories of, uh, of spiders and insects and uh, the morellomorphs, uh, a new word in our vocabulary. And uh, and you definitely with this wonderful presentation and the slides and the uh, artistic uh, expressions did bring it to life for us. So thank you so much. All the best to you in the future. Thanks and I very hope much. your strong presentation is an absolute smashing success. <laughs> and I'm sure it will be based on the presentation you gave us today. So thank you so much. Thank you. And I hope
hope that the takeaway will also be that, you know, this discovery was made by an amateur collector. And so you guys should all get out there, keep looking at stuff, and you never know what you'll find. And I, I would just like to thank Nature 12. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm an infrequent uh, visitor or member, I guess. Uh, I don't come up to all the presentations, uh, but uh, this was a bigger interest to me. And uh, so I applaud uh, Nature 12's uh, willingness to uh, uh, you know, diversify uh, in terms of his presentations. Uh, really, really like the presentation. Really glad Nature 12 uh, hosted it. Thank you very much. <laughs> much appreciated. <laughs>